Welcome to my talk. Um, first, let's get the ugly out of the way. So, who the hell am I? Um, so, my name is Vranat Srdjan. I come from Novi Sad. I'm a business owner, developer, consultant, formerly known as mercenary. I'm writing terrible code that performs exceptionally. I have this awesome team that is here in the audience. And for the past couple of years, we have been building um, big uh, applications for our clients. Many of them are distributed. So, um, some of those have started creating revenues in the range of hundreds of million dollars. Uh, this is not like bragging, this is just trying to set uh, the bar that I might actually know what I'm talking about. Before we begin, a uh, word of warning. Um, I'm partial to using images, as I do believe that they um, drive the message harder into your brain, and I also don't have any code on my slides. Uh, liar, I'm lying, only on one side. Um, as we're talking about distributed systems, uh, the speaker, me, may or may not exhibit race conditions with words, lag in thoughts, occasional set fault or OOM. This is not a result of uh, stage fright or poor preparedness. This is a carefully choreographed act that you should not try at home. So, welcome to the talk, DDT talk. Um, and no, this is not the kind of DDD that you think about. This, and today we are talking about distributed domain destruction. Before we begin, um, we need to define what is a distributed system. How many of you know what it is? Raise your hands. Awesome. Okay, so let's do two definitions. Um, simple definition is that it is a system where you distribute processing of uh, tasks to other workers. Costly tasks. By costly tasks, I mean anything ranging from heavy computation and CPU utilization to long-running processes. If we are talking in the context of web applications, basically anything that can't be done within a request is a candidate for distribution and background processing. Now, a more realistic definition uh, by Leslie B. Lamport in 1987, he's basically uh, the person you want to read about if you need to know about distributed systems, said that a distributed system is one which the failure of a computer you didn't know existed can render your, whole, your own computer unusable, or in this case, your whole system. So, crash course. Um, imagine you just made a shiny new application that scrapes information about products from different websites every 12 hours. Rather simple setup. You have your, you get the HTML from a URL. Uh, look for a few things in it. Update the database. Um, create a screenshot for auditing purposes. Um, a cron job will trigger the process, and things work really well. As the number of products increase, uh, your current setup uh, becomes insufficient and underperformant for your needs. So now you need to switch to a distributed system by using task and message queues. The distinctions and ins and outs uh, are a whole nother talk, but for now we will focus on what um, you can, should, and need to do with a setup to get the distributed system running. Basically, um, you take an X to your code and you split things up. Uh, so you have one set of workers getting the HTML, another set of workers parsing it up and updating the database, another set of workers to create the screenshot from the URL, uh, you add some publishing scripts into the mix, the ones that start the whole thing, and you add a message broker like RabbitMQ. And this is great because once you split things up like this, you can scale as much as your client wallet allows, or heaven forbids your wallet. Congratulations, you're now disturbed. Um, sorry, distributed. So, after you have your, your application in a state where you can actually distribute it, you need to go to your client and talk to them or, or to your CTO or whoever and you lay out your plan, you know. So you want some thousand workers to process this spread across like 20 instances. Um, that's some 50 workers per instance. So you can get cheaper machines and bring the cost down and title with the message brokers. And then you go on and on and on and on and on. And then you see it. Uh, you see that moment when you actually lost them. The next part of the conversation goes something like this. 
Um, so why don't we get like bigger instances that can use like 500 workers per instance? That way we have less hassle and it might be cheaper because we have less overhead. This is something that you should not do, but you really, really want. You just want to yell, no, you stupid, cheap ass bastards. Use your innovate, we're in the works for that. But still, yeah, I mean, take what you can from that and you still get to launch your application and launch your distributed system and see where it goes. So, sorry. Uh, in order for your distributed system to work, you need to keep your workers running constantly uh, because they will exit due to timeout, no jobs available, or some exception. Um, so you need to run them constantly and you have to use demons to keep an eye on them and start them in any number of instances that you need. Most popular ones are Supervisor and Ubuntu. Um, so, uh, super, uh, sorry, Upstart is basically canonical stake on Supervisor and it, is integra it was integrated in Ubuntu. They changed it later in recent versions. Both are well documented, both are straightforward to use. Um, and of course, both are going to bite you in the ass. Supervisor is older, more mature, easy to set up, uh, better is included, like everything Python works fine. Um, unless you need to run, say, 350 plus workers at any given time. Uh, in our case, we needed 500. Uh, what happens is supervisor will try to run them all and will keep crashing them uh, and eventually it will stop responding. Uh, what happens is, I mean, it's beautiful, and my guess is that it happens because depending on your version of Python and the number of file descriptors set and stuff like that, it's basically a nasty problem. If you use an alternative like Upstart, um, you get to use stanzas, which is um, basically a fancy name for commands and templates. Um, it's a bit com more complicated to set up. If you handle like 600-ish workers without a problem, it also uses concept of signals, uh, so you can control your workers, and you can fine-grain this. And that's where Upstart starts behaving weir weirdly. If you have like five to ten types of workers on one machine because you have a big S instance, and it can it has like three to five signals per per worker type. Sometimes Upstart will just ignore those signals, and suddenly you will have like situation where you try to stop your workers and Upstart just ignored the signal and kept them, kept them on chugging. Uh, both edge cases have been documented and reported on the respected issue trackers and last time I checked, um, there were no definitive fix. Sooner or later, you will be looking like this. I mean, you can't escape it. So, we come to something that is serious and basically essential to any distributed application logging and counting. In a normal application, it is nice to have, um, or can be important, as this is one of the tools that will tell you what's going on. In a distributed systems, these are basically essential, because that is about the only way that you're going to know what went wrong, and maybe logs will show you how it went wrong. And when I say log, I mean log and count, uh, not only outputting information from your uh, application to the files and logs, but basically counting anything that you can grab and then you graph it and then you see how many, for example, counters at any given point have, uh, in time have been incre incremented and if you see a drop, you know something is wrong and you can take steps to fix it. So every time an error happens, you can actually improve upon that. When you aggregate all of this data uh, and put it in one place, suddenly uh, you can see every action of your system uh, and you know what is happening. Uh, when you run something locally, it might take five seconds, ten seconds, but you have no actually idea, uh, no actual idea what it means. Uh, and then you, when you deploy things, then you need to know how long it takes, how long the queue is, and then you start getting the context in which you can actually measure the length of an operation. The more metrics you collect, the fuller picture you can have about the state of your system. Basically, collect all the data: um, memory usage, I rates, CPU rates whatever you can, just log it and push it into your, your, your store and graph it. Eventually, once you measure your application, you know what's going on. 
One of the best tools out there for this is StatsD from Etsy. It's basically a daemon that's running on your server. It allows you to send its measurements. It collects them and stores them on a somewhere, and then later you can grab them. As I said, that logging and counting is very important because <coughs> logs and counters are trying, or not trying, they are actually lying to you. Um, and it's a sad fact. They don't do it on purpose. It is just sometimes you'll encounter a piece of code uh, that, sh that will look okay on the surface, and you do inspection and you do analysis, and it's fine. And then you, uh, <coughs> oh, already, and then you put it in production, and all hell breaks loose. Um, one application we developed was using DynamoDB as one of these backends. Yeah, backends, multiple backends. Don't worry about it. So let's first see what is DynamoDB. Um, it's Amazon, Amazon's take on document and NoSQL databases. It is built with speed and scale in mind, and by setting proper throughput on the reads and the writes, you're being charged money. The more speed you need, the more money you spend. That said, after using it for two years, I believe it is a prime example of everything that is wrong with the NoSQL database. And this is coming from someone who has cursory knowledge of the database systems. Back to the story. The application in question processes about 4 million items a day, multiple times. It is quite normal to have two or three runs a day. So when you do the math, that means that at least you have like 10 million records per day. The data is stored in a temporal database, and that means that every day there is a different table. Getting data out of it is a separate world of pain, like, but of no concern for this event, as per Amazon best practices. The logging metrics follow the ingestion of the data. We have exception uh, handlers in place. Everything looks airtight and good. The data is being written in batches, uh, because that is the optimal way to do it, using a batch writer, again, as per Amazon's best practices. And then you get a call. Like, are we writing to DynamoDB? And the fun begins. Um, I'm looking into DynamoDB console. I'm looking into tables. And I see the data is missing, and not a bit data. There's a lot of data missing. Over the course of a week, 40 million plus records were lost. And here's the best part, nobody knows where they are. The logs are clean, the metrics are clean, just what the hell happened? Um, after like no hours of head scratching and cursing, I know that something is broken, I just get, I can't put my finger on it. Um, I'm running workers manually to see the output live, no dice. Then I start wondering, why wasn't there any exception? And I mean, like, ever. I mean, I like to think I'm good, but I'm not that good, you know? And that leads me to the documentations and leads me to the biggest WTF moment so far. So here on the slide, uh, you see a screenshot of the documentation for the DynamoDB client constructor. <coughs> Apparently, nobody in Amazon knows how to use Bolt. And I would like everybody to be honest with me. How many of you would actually read this completely through? <laughs> Liar. <laughs> <laughs> Liar. <laughs> um, so let me see if this works. So here at the end, you see this error. Execute when an error is encountered, encountered executing a batch write item operation. Otherwise, errors are ignored. So let me say this again. By default and by design, when an error happens in the batch writer, he will ignore it. Drop the payload, continue on, giving you a false positive, which in turn will cause four, day, four days of worth of data to be lost. In, on the other hand, if you register your callable, uh, you will get an exception as, a, as an argument that, that, that does not tell you much. By the time you get the exception, the payload has already been lost, and you're left there twid twiddling your thumbs, thinking happy, happy thoughts. Fine. I have the error handler in place. I can see what is happening, and I'm starting to lose my mind. There are two types of her er errors happening, and 60% of them boil down to the simple thing, and that is typecasting. Here's what's happening. Uh, DynamoDB needs to have its data, uh, data typed, and it only has uh, primitive types like number, string, or 
composite text or something, and ultimately the pay payload is a JSON. If you do not encase your numeric values, Java, because that is what DynamoDB is written on, will try to infer the type from the past value, and di then DynamoDB will start screaming and having a piece of it, resulting in an exception. So, no. Other 40% of the uh, exceptions uh, were on string values that basically went along the lines of you cannot mix multiple types on a string. Um, I never got to the bottom of that one. Uh, the failure rate was high enough, and we migrated away from DynamoDB to MySQL. As the system was distributed, it was easy to do because we just stopped the workers, rewrote the part of the code that was uh, right, doing the write to write to MySQL, started the process, everything would work, and caught, Q eventually caught up. Um, so the system was launched, the performance was there, everything was running smoothly, and then funny things started happening. Uh, the system would slow down, then would go back to full strength, completely random, not a like, hint of a pattern. Things were shining along, but you know, you know something is wrong. Again, logs were clean, um, metrics were clean, the ones that we capture are good, but I decided to add more, more like metrics to time the different parts of the application process, and suddenly once graphed, I see that certain values show the spike. And that are, uh, those values were basically uh, timers for the operation which writes data to the database. So let's say if you have like 2,000 workers and each of them is writing to the database, what do you call this? Does anybody know? DDoS. We were basically DDoSing our database. Lovely. So again, we took the X to the code, reworked the system just a bit, so now there is a separate queue with dedicated workers writing to the data, uh, database. This allows the processing workers to work at full capacity, and any data that needs to be written dyna dyna uh, sorry, to the database uh, is published to a separate queue, no more waiting time. On the other hand, uh, the DB workers now don't have to do like insert per message, we can batch them up, say like 100 messages per, per batch, which leads to a mo mo lot more performance and not overtaxing our database. And suddenly things is fast. Uh, when the transition was done, uh, we were 200% over the required capacity that we can handle. So we could actually shut down a part of our infrastructure and save money. So, another story. Um, one day, one of our systems stops. Nobody knows why. And I mean like that stop. ISSH in, the terminal is always molasses. Turns out there is no more drive space on a 100 gigabyte drive. The usual suspects give nothing. I decide to look into the logs, and lo and behold, there is a 80 plus gigabyte log file. I mean, literally zero bytes left. I can't open it, get, get it, whatever, so I have to delete it and things are back to normal. Monitor the system for a few days, nothing happens. Months, months pass by, I forget. Again, the system drops. Same drill, same results. And again, clean it, move along. And when the third, third time it happened, like I had enough, and I said, okay, I'm gonna fix this. I mean, I'm gonna make this app great, and I'm gonna get the client to pay for it. So I get, um, I get the logs files, I download them to my machine, like 100, 100 megabyte logs, like nothing special. And I pick one and start to unpack it, and I break my machine. I aborted when it grew over 50 gigabytes of data. So I choose a smaller, smaller like a zip file, unpack it, 25, 6 gigabyte text file. Awesome. So now I have some evidence of, of what is going on, and the size of the, the size of the log is not normal. I open it. 99.99% .99 of the log is one line repeated over and over. Warning index is out of bounds. So now I can pinpoint the problem, and it turns out that it's an edge case. Basically, we are using semaphores and shared memory. Don't ask why, and some arrays. And under certain conditions, the index would, um, would uh, break out of the bounds and it would never resolve. And the PHP grade that it is would just print out a nice warning and chug along. That would, um, again, fill the hard drive, and by the time we caught it, it was too late. No unit test, no metrics. That was fixed. Three lines of code, that's it. Why wasn't there a log partition, uh, separate log partition? Um, the reason is 10x. We had a 10x engineer working, working above us. He was in charge. 
he was very smart, very clever, uh, usually made the right decisions, but they were short-sighted because he believed that he can uh, change them as we go easily. Unfortunately, many of those things were undocumented, and the time came for this person to leave, and we were left with gaps in the knowledge. Um, sometimes ancestral, sometimes not. We had an EBS volume set up for logs, but it was not set up to auto-mount on, re auto on reboot, and this was documented exactly nowhere, and nobody noticed until crunch time. Live and learn and document. Um, there's an S in, S in success. So again, under the fine day, another ticket, a lot of data is missing. It's a fairly simple system, collects data from external sources, scrape them, um, distribute across several instances without rhyme or, rhyme or reason. Part of them are basically failing and not yielding any data. So because of your scrape in the HTML, I mean, it's a simple markup change. Yay. So I started doing the sample HTMLs, and I spent a couple of hours on them because they are variants. Um, and you know, as it happens sometimes, you need to analyze them, integrate them into unit tests, and everything is still passing, and production is still dropping data, still no pattern inside. Um, I you take, to, take to the browser, recreate all the steps. I can do it. I mean, it's a time-consuming process until I check everything, but still, I mean, I can do it. I create a curl request from the Chrome DevTools, Execute it from the, from the CLI, from the terminal, works. Do it from the application, things don't work. Okay, um, I output the last request and response, basically a two-liner. First line is shows you the uh, HTTP method or operation, and the other one shows the URL. And then I get the biggest break. Um, when I do a post, the last request shows get. Like, what? Uh, and remember, the code has not been changed. This should not happen. So I take out the big guns and take out the Wireshark. Um, it's a network protocol analyzer. I capture the data. Uh, then I basically see this, 301, move permanently. And I don't see that in the application because the redirection is enabled and last request, of course, will be a get. And that is the reason why it is happening uh, randomly, because the site we were scraping was starting to roll out the HTTPS enforcement, and not all servers were configured to redirect. 18 hours to locate, 20 seconds to fix. Fun stuff. Two config files. And we get to the last story, crates, browsers, and database. So again, um, one of the systems that we built uh, for the client, uh, there are like 300 people using it. It's a back office system. Amongst other things, it does, does warehousing and packaging, and one more in like EST. Things were starting to pick up the pace for the day. Um, we started getting reports that things are slowing down. I um, mean, and by slowing down, I mean like going down like Titanic. Uh, we are noticing slowdowns across all the systems, across all the workers. Something is wrong. Robert here is looking into logs, um, seeing a lot of failed database operations. I'm scrubbing into the database, listing the processes. There are quite a few of them. Quite old, waiting for data, writing data. I don't know, and I don't remember, don't care. And like things are slowly not going on. And I mean, this is not a small server. This is like an R34X large. We have 16 CPUs and like 122 gigabytes of RAM. And it was handling nice load so far, but I mean, now it's acting like a Titanic. The web is going down. All of the systems are starting to slow. We need to do something. I'm starting to like kill the oldest processes in the database. Things are starting to improve, but there are, there are new, new ones coming in. Things are again starting to, to slow down. I'm like playing whack-a-mole with queries. Team is trying to determine like from where do these queries come, and it's time to decide. They identified that the queries were coming from the warehouse-related code, so we make the decision to kill the web server, make certain like everybody times out after 30 seconds, nasty solution, but desperate times, and so we did. And suddenly things are back to normal. Like what the hell? People continued working normally, making money. The on-site team has been sent to inspect the packaging stations to see what is going wrong, and they come back with a mother of a story. One of the packaging stations was left unattended. One of the bar barcode scanners that is used to scan the crates were, was not left in the proper place. Due to some mishap, something or other, it slid down to the keyboard, <coughs> hitting the F5 button. <laughs> yeah. This, because the browser is like in a full screen mode, it's effectively triggering like infinite refresh. 
<laughs> and the page is being displayed like using some very costly queries, and that is killing our web server and the rest of the system. So <laughs> we come to the end. Like, this perfectly sums up like my day in distributed systems. If you are not able to handle like things, this is fine. While everything is on fire, I mean. You're not in the right place. But on the other hand, working with distributed systems is as <coughs> close that you will be working like with a proper living thing because your systems will act differently depending on your external input, external services. Maybe they will fail. Maybe they will change the markup. Maybe something else will happen. Things will slow. You will see all sorts of edge cases and freaky things that you will never, never think of. But still, I mean, I think I find my niche and I'm very happy with it. Thank you.